Hello YouTubers. Welcome to part two of my continuous fusion video dealing with the pepper mill fusion reactor. Cool. We're going to talk about some of the pressures and temperatures that are going to have to be achieved inside the pepper mill fusion reactor to be able to make it work. And we're going to end up probably erasing this and drawing us a new one here. We'll just talk about it for today. Let's talk about what happens inside the inflationary core where it takes the dark matter and pulls it apart like taffy. Well, not every single proton stabilizes at our transverse binding energy junction at this layer of space. So what does happen though, is we're dealing with proton-based mass or hadronic mass. The hadronic mass, as we found in our particle colliders, can blow apart. And when it blows apart, you get all these secondary particles and you get a ton of heat. So what's happening here is you get this continuous stream of particles and you get large channeled electron beams shooting out that way. That's where you get those large exit vents that we see in our protostar pictures. Those are incredibly powerful, super hot electron beams, way beyond anything we can create here. And they're channeled down this great big awesome magnetic guide that we talked about last time that is induced by these spheres and it creates a near perfect channel for these super powerful electron beams and these electron beams of course as you can see here are what well what are they well they're accelerated electrons from popped almost protons protons that didn't quite you know, reach that transverse binding energy junction point. And instead of forming into hydrogen, they are just being ripped apart and shot out as electrons and other hadronic particles from parent particles. Basically anything you can make from a proton is, is shooting down this funnel. And because it's a big long channel, you end up with a nice, beam effect, electron beams are, are gathering up and forming up and, and just shooting out here. It's, it's actually one of the most powerful electron guns in existence is inside a star. And that's, that's your channel to create or to induce fusion at the pinch points induced by the field from the fusion tamp spheres. Essentially it creates a pinch point for this electron beam fed material so you get super 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 heated plasma now earlier it's super cold super cold and then later it becomes super 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 hot because the fusion task here says stop and all that stuff just bounces around and you get this crazy oscillation cavity in here which is kind of like a charging cavity and then just like I mentioned before now how hot does it have to be? Well, according to Princeton University at the Tokamak Fusion Reactor, they had a reference 510 million degree K test shot where they achieved fusion. I'm willing to accept that number that inside these exit channels we can easily reach 510 million degrees Kelvin. Now, we've still got the lightning which probably adds that final little bleh, bleh, squish to the whole channel. Like a... <laughs> Like, like cow water, <laughs> squeezing that out and, and it spits the hydrogen out, probably in pulses. Perhaps that's why we've detected fusion pulses coming from the, you know, the, I guess it'd be the polar regions of the sun and that's essentially why we're trying to reproduce it here with pulse reactors. And it, we've probably seen that in our ultra high resolution Doppler shifts and different imaging systems that we've used on the sun. But it, we're still not we're still not doing it like the sun does it. As you can see, we have an inflationary point here. We have massive electron beams coming down here. And then we have this agitator. I haven't seen a single fusion reactor that has the agitator in there that creates the pinch points using mechanical magnetic confinement fusion. There, there's not a, you know, there's no moving parts on our tokamak fusion reactor. It's all 
It's all gases and magnetic fields we're using to stamp it down. Well, that's part of it. I, I believe there needs to be an agitator added to the current designs. And, of course, the, the washboard magnetic field that creates uh, troughs and peaks in the magnetic confinement fusion as the agitator turns and pushes that plasma up into a up into a corner and squishes it. And then of course, I also think we should probably have some lightning. Oh, we gotta have lightning, right? We gotta have some big old uh, electron beams getting shot down in there. And that's gonna be our ignition. Now, I'm gonna say the best place to put that, of course, is gonna be at the Z machine facility. I don't believe lasers are gonna help us at this point. Uh, that's more for a different type of Testing. That's more. That's more fusion testing. If you want to actually build a continuous fusion reactor, I don't believe that facility is properly equipped unless you're to move the Z machine to there and, and use the lasers as a as a piece in that in that dynamo. But I, I, it looks like we don't have this machine here on Earth yet, or anything close to it, which is probably good because I don't really think they know what they're doing quite yet. They've got some some good tests that are based upon uh, you know kinetic collapsing. Uh, it's called a confinement fusion, magnetic confinement, inertial confinement fusion. But we're still not really approaching that. So when we look at what's coming out of here, we do have we do have hydrogen, hydrogen gases, which uh, you know we're we got hydrogen gases, but it it's so it's so accelerated. And there's so much gas. I mean, compared to what we've got down here, we've got nothing that resembles this down here. And you know, we talked a little bit about the pepper mill fusion reactor. I really wanted to get in that. One of the things you're going to be able to do, and that's some of the things that I've seen online as well, is that you're going to be able to use a fusion exit aperture like this for propulsion. My son, great kid, he asked me, well, what good would a fusion rocket be? And I said, well, it's going to be about five million times more powerful than a conventional rocket. So now we're talking about a rocket system which is pretty easy to build I got I gotta say we're not talking about confining this in a in a in a ball and trying to hold it we're talking about pinching it and then releasing it and using a bell reflector to just let it exit out so if, if you really wanted to do that let's take this thing and we're gonna put it inside a, a bell reflector and and now we've got a bell reflector that's gonna it's gonna take that output and we're gonna be able to use really cool magnetic magnetic control you know for the for the plasma and we're going to be able to vector that thrust if we want to outward so when we got this thrust we're going to we're going to draw all the way through this we're going to we got this 5 million times more powerful rocket engine that we're going to stick on that thing so we're just going to put a big bell reflector on the pepper mill fusion reactor pepper mill fusion reactor. Why is it pepper mill? It's just like a pepper mill. You take the, the corns and you crunch them up and that's essentially what's going on here. Now we should make a separate video of what I'm talking about there where we can blow that up and really look at that because I think we can do it with that. It's just I really wanted to discuss real quick what we've got and you know with that song playing in the background this is this is the type of rocket that's going to be able to carry us anywhere in the solar system really really fast with minimal amounts of fuel. You could probably put all different kinds of fuels in there too including some of the higher elements. The amount of pressure you're going to be able to achieve with the agitation, you know, where you actually have a crushing mechanism, the peak on the crush is going to be several orders of magnitude higher than just a, a flat, you know, pancake type crusher. Flat pancake type crusher as opposed to wave crest crushing, you're going to have way more crushing power than you just saw with my cat falling off there. So now we're going to have super rockets. We're going to have now, if you're gonna do this as a power generator, well, I, I guess you just stick a turbine up here, and and now now we've got now we've got now we've got motion. Now we can do what well, we can we, we can do anything. We can we can do fusion powered cars, fusion powered jet uh, jet planes. You can do all these different fusion powered things. All you do is collect this here, and, and what do you use to to produce it? Well, you can use hydrogen, or if you do it right, you can just use atmosphere. Now. You're talking eh, a little bit different than the Tokamak. The Tokamak, they're taking a very large volume. I mean, you've seen those things. The, the new one they're building over at the IT, 
uh, it was the the big spherical uh, tokamak fusion reactor, the big spherical reactor, this huge, this giant thing. These can be small. I mean, like calculating how tiny you can make this and, and make multiple points and you just add more apertures if you need more thrust. I think finding out the minimum requirements here for achieving magnetic confinement fusion using an agitation and a wave crest fusion point. I, as soon as we figure that out, you just add more aperture points and you get more thrust or more output. And then of course you use a turbine and collect it. It's a little bit different than the, the schemes I've been seeing out there. And, and let's say this isn't enough. I mean, you could always, you could always put some inlets right here on, a, on a, a regular turbine that let normal air in as the primary air rushes out or the, the fusion product rushes out. I mean, it could definitely, under a high speed situation, that of course it might just shoot out that way too. Depends on your pressure. If your pressure is truly five million times, you probably don't want any apertures there. All right, so let's uh, let's draw our bell here real quick. There we go. So I think we can go to space pretty easy with a fusion rocket system that maybe even can use atmosphere. You may not have to use just straight hydrogen to do it. It can be a mixture, you know, like a, you know, a little bit of hydrogen and and use the atmosphere as, a, as an expanding uh, agi agitation agent inside there. So can you do a normal fusion? Is there going to be enough pressure in this type of pinch point aperture? And the answer to that I believe is yes. 510 million degrees, you know, it says, oh, we gotta, we got to have room to heat that up. Well, you can, you can create a, a longer heater essentially, heater portion using electron beams. And what's your product? Well, if you, if you produce the electron beams and you're using a turbine or some type of turbine system that feeds off of a bleed, I mean, honestly, if, if it's that powerful, you should be able to just put a, a bleed off of that. And now you've got this little tiny turbine here that's more than enough to create the electron beams necessary to heat up the plasma where it's getting most of our energy is coming from the fusion portion anyways. So the sun, the sun, I wanted to talk about one other thing. You know, if you ever look at the solar system on edge, oh, it's real pretty, right? But if you flip it over, you notice that the solar system is actually moving on the flat axis through space. So all the planets are going around like that with the, with the sun in the middle. It's, it's kind of like the sun is a big giant fusion rocket. You know, we're in orbit around the central black hole of the galaxy, but honestly, it looks like this is a giant rocket, a big fusion rocket, and to me that's essentially what it, what it definitely appears to be. So we should copy that and make our own rockets so that we can travel out to places, you know, in our own solar system, maybe get some asteroids, pull them together, start mining them. Honestly, if we have access to very fast propulsion, I we're just missing some fuel, I guess, so we're going to need to get some some water, Europa. I hear there's some really water-rich asteroids out there we can pull our hydrogen from. And, and from what I understand, that most of your gases that are out there in interstellar space are hydrogen anyways. I mean, there's not a lot of it, but there's there's enough of it probably to collect, at least in a, in a big magnetic scoop or something. Either way, we can probably get it from water and we don't really need to think about exotic things unless you're traveling really, really, really fast. And if you're traveling really, really, really fast, you're probably running into enough interstellar hydrogen to be able to power your fusion reactor. You just have to be going fast enough, like a like a interstellar scramjet or ramjet using hydrogen. So it'd be an interstellar, interstellar scramjet, ramjet fed, ramjet, there you go, ramjet fed, and you just feed it with hydrogen. I mean, maybe that's what our sun's doing, is traveling fast enough to grab hydrogen, but I, I don't think that's going to be, uh, well, it might be, you never know, we have to look at it. But right now, I'm focusing on the dark energy perspective of it, and we're, we can see that we need a channel, we need a compression point, we need an agitator. We don't have an agitator in any of the current fusion reactors, and I think that's probably the next step we need to take, is actually put a physical agitator in there. I'm looking at the designs, talking about fusion reactor, that's, that's great. I think, honestly, we need to talk about expelling the, the components out into either a turbine-based system or something similar. I mean, they're like, oh, we're using deuterium. Well, okay, fine. I heard that it's easier to do different things when it comes to uh, fusion base. You know, it's easier to do deuterium and tritium. I hear that those are not as good to use. I mean, they're really toxic to us. So they may not be the best idea to use. 
you know, it's radioactive and whatnot, radioactive tritium. So, our products we should produce, especially if we're going to use it for engines, for for jet engines or or rocket ships that go to space and use fusion engines to get you off the ground. If it's five million times more powerful, even if it's one million times more powerful, the, the difficulty is going to be in engineering the structure for the reflector. I mean, this is going to be the easy part, and I'm sure that that your your agitation system and your pinch point system is going to be pretty simple to do once we start building them. I mean, I envision, you know, big old uh, wavy shaped agitator with a wavy shaped got, uh, cup and the thing just, we spin it up and send the gas through, heat it up and then start dropping that agitator down to compress the channels and you start getting burst. Not just one, you get pop, 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 bursting all the way around. All these points just start popping, pop, 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 as you get the fusion product being uh, where you get these compressions and the temperature is high enough to do that. And, you know, as long as we're using magnetic guide channels like the sun uses, I mean, we should have no real problem with confinement. You don't really have, this chamber here doesn't have to get to the sustained temperature of the tokamak. It just has to get closer and then using Using wave crest fusion theory, as the pressure goes up, we achieve fusion at a wave crest. We don't we don't try to bring up like like the whole the temperature of the reactor, which would be this to achieve fusion. We're not trying to make the whole reactor that temperature. We're just trying to make these exit apertures or or a small portion just before it exits those apertures. We're trying to reach these pressures and these temperatures at the fusion point just near the exit apertures of the pepper mill fusion reactor. I think that's probably going to be a better bet than the tokamak because you don't have to create this great big housing and, and there's a way to feed it properly and there's a lot of the problems that I've seen with the tokamak. I mean you, you fill a tokamak once and you pop it and then you got to recharge it and you got to over and over and over again. I think this is going to give us access to where we have a lower temperature funnel and then only at the high exit aperture points do you need these temperatures and these pressures. Incidentally, the pressures that I found for hydrogen deuterium is roughly 150 gigapascals. So that gives us uh, how, how, how high a pressure we're supposed to need for that. Uh, look at rhenium. Rhenium is going to be a future metal. It's superconductive, produces a nice field. Uh, it's probably going to be... Well, they're probably going to be made out of rhenium or something close to it. You need, you need to have something that's very, very strong. Rhenium diboride, I believe, is, is a superconductive material that is also incredibly strong. We've got all these things that we've learned from this, and I believe that, that we're, we're, we're ready to design the terrestrial fusion reactor. But I'm, like I said before, though, you could easily convert that into a rocket engine, and we can go to space, we can go to other stars, we can do all kinds of cool stuff. We can send probes out there, we can start asteroid mining. Definitely we'll have the temperatures and pressures needed and the electrical power that we need out there in remote locations to be able to do this. So 150 gigapascals, 510 million degrees K, but just at these little tiny points here as opposed to the entire chamber. You don't need the whole chamber like that, you just need the exit apertures that. Anyways, Welcome to my dreamer's island, and this is where I believe we're going to go next in fusion technology. Pepper mill fusion reactor, we're going to actually draw one of those out. At, I mean, we have kind of drawn one out based upon, you know, stellar mass here, but we're definitely going in the right direction. Once again, I'm Zio. Hope you enjoyed the video. Talk to you next time.